But uh, without further ado, we'll hand over to, to Jess Edwards, who's a member of South London SWP. Uh, she's also a teacher and is a member of the, the National Executive Committee for the National Education Union. So I'll hand over to Jess. Thank you. First of all, I just wanted to start with an apology because I really hate it when people read off a screen, but I couldn't, I couldn't find a printer and I've run out of ink, so I have to read the meeting from my iPad. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so I guess what I wanted to start with is um, what I want to get across is the idea of education, what we teach and how we teach, being a really huge ideological battleground um, in the society that we live in and if you think about learning obviously we think about schooling and we think about universities mass education of that kind but obviously learning is much more than that isn't it and I, I want to start by saying that I think learning is something that is um, intrinsic to what makes us human if you think about what Marx says when he talks about what makes us human our, is our ability to shape and change the world around us to imagine and to reimagine um, the world to develop huge feats of um, human accomplishment uh, from you know the, the buildings that we see all around us to rockets in space all of these things um, are the product um, of, of learning um, the, the fund, a fundamental um, facet of human um, existence and you think about from the moment we're born we are learning all of the time and we're not just learning reading and writing and those kinds of things that I'll talk a lot about in the meeting but we're learning much more than that aren't we we're learning about um, our place in the world we're learning about our relationships to other people uh, we're learning about things that we like things that we don't like things that scare us how to overcome fears uh, how we deal with complex situations um, and 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 um, and all of that um, kind of thing, really. And in terms of formal learning, the kind that takes place in our schools and our universities, in, in the West, you know, at least, everybody in this room will have their own experience of that, um, of that, um, of that uh, system. They'll have their own opinions that have been formed in relation to how their own schooling experience, their university experience was. And, and I think that schooling shapes massively the kind of adult that, that we become, the kind of person that we become. So I, I, maybe it's just me, but I look back on my schooling quite often, probably because I'm a teacher, and think about the ways in which it shaped me, my confidence, whether I'm good at something, whether I'm not good at something, um, and, you know, the ways in which I... Uh, tackle things that are difficult um, whether I think you know for example I wasn't any good at mathematics at, sc at school makes me you know nervous about mathematics today um, I'm sure that everybody in the room has got their own experiences so you know with teachers that you liked teachers that you didn't like why you liked them why you didn't like them um, it's a huge part of, uh, of, of us um, and of ourselves so uh, you know I'm starting with that because I want to get across a sense that education and the way that it works in society today is important and it's important for us to get our heads around the way it works um, and what we have as Marxists to say about it. So to go into it, I want to just start with a quote from David Cameron. This was just before he was um, Prime Minister, um, and this is a, he gave a speech about national identity in 2009, and, and what he says about education in the speech I think is really telling. So he says this, he says, It's vitally important that we bring back proper teaching of British history into our schools. We won't get very far in promoting Britishness if we don't have a feel for Britain's history and Britain's heritage. It is a tragedy that we have swept away the teaching of narrative history and replaced it with, bite -sized, disjointed, with a bite-sized, disjointed approach to learning about historical events. And the results of a recent survey highlight only too well what happens when you shift away from learning actual knowledge, such as facts and dates, this failed approach has led us to the great irony that most British-born citizens would struggle to answer the questions on our citizenship test. And he goes on, we must defend our armed forces, our monarchy, and our democratic tradition. And the reason that I give that quote is because I want to get um, a sense across, really, 
about how important the school curriculum is to the ruling class um, in, in society. Um, education is something that they see not only as just about how they reproduce the next generation of workers that are fit for exploitation, and that's a huge part of what education is for them, but it's also about how they transmit ruling class ideology. And um, what I um, really want to do is take a look at, look at exactly what they are doing today, both formally in terms of the curriculum that we learn in our schools, but also in form that what, what's called the what Dewey, uh, John Dewey t uh, talked about over 100 years ago, not a Marxist, but a, a you know, progressive educationalist, um, as being the hidden curriculum. The other things that we learn at school that aren't just about um, what is in the, uh, the written curriculum. So... Um, People will know if they're teachers or if they're, um, I can see there's a lot of school students here, which is brilliant, um, that we have quite a new curriculum in our schools that was introduced um, a couple of years ago uh, by Michael Gove. And um, I'm going to quote from Gove. Um, I'm going to tell you what Gove said about his justification for the introduction of the new curriculum in schools. So he said this. He said, it was an automatic assumption of my predecessors in cabinet office that the education they had enjoyed, the culture they had benefited from, the literature they had read, the history they had grown up learning were all worth knowing. They thought that the case was almost so self-evident it scarcely needed to be made. To know who Pericles was, why he was important, why acquaintance with his actions, thoughts and words mattered didn't need to be explained or justified. It was the mark of an educated person and to aspire to be educated and, and to be thought of as educated was the noblest of ambitions. The eminent Victorian, I'm sorry, it's quite a long one, but I think it's a good one. The eminent Victorian and muscular liberal Matthew Arnold encapsulated what liberal learning should be. He wanted to introduce young minds to the best that had been thought and written. His was a cause which was subsequently embraced by leaders of Victorian opinion as a civilizing mission, which it was their moral duty to discharge. Um, and now, I don't want anyone to come away with an idea that I... Uh, do not think children should be introduced to great works of classical literature um, or you know, classical music or opera and um, you know, all of those kinds of things. But what I think that quote really shows is that the, sort of the Tory ideologues have an idea that there is a fixed body of knowledge that is worth knowing. There is a core uh, body of knowledge that is inherently worth knowing and the kind of knowledge that they um, think is the most worthwhile is the kind of knowledge that they taught in the grammar schools of old you know the, Il the Iliad um, you know Austin and um, all of these things and again I'm just going to give that caveat again I, I do think that it's really fantastic to learn about those things and the um, things um, that we should um, be teaching. What they're saying is that a particular kind of knowledge is the knowledge that is worthwhile in our schools. And I'm really sorry, and I'm not going to uh, do it again, but I am going to quote from Gove again because I just think he's brilliant for shining a light on exactly the Tory, um, the Tory ideology. So he says this, he says... There is a particular and, to my mind, quite indefensible assumption among some that the only cultural experiences to which the young are entitled or even open are those which have a direct and contemporary relevance to their lives. So Caroline Duffy and drum and bass are okay, but Austin and Eliot, Cicero and Wagner are out. Now, we don't have a problem with Austin and Eliot and Cicero um, and, and yeah, um, and Wagner. But what we do have a problem is, is the exclusion of other authors, of other forms of culture, of other kinds of learning and experiences. And actually, there's a really good Marxist um, educationalist who works at the Institute, John Yandel. A lot of people might have read some of his stuff or seen him speak and, uh, and stuff before. And um, he, he did a really brilliant project with English teachers um, where he talked to them about the English curriculum and how they felt about it. Um, and he interviews um, a, a teacher, Hannah, in 2016. Um, and I think what she says is really important because it's not about what's included, it's about what's excluded from the curriculum. So I he says, she says, I was a bit annoyed about the selection of GCSE texts because we're doing Lord of the Flies, Jekyll and Hyde, Romeo and Juliet, and well, that's it, isn't it? And in, the, in all of that, there's the nurse and there's Juliet and there's the maid witness in the murder of Caro and Jekyll and Hyde. And other than that, there's no significant female parts or characters. And then 
and further to that, no trace of any kind of ethnicity or multiculturalism in, in it at all. I love Steinbeck and I love Golding and I think they're fantastic writers, but even in Steinbeck, the only female or black characters are incredibly marginal, don't have proper names, and I think there's a problem with just constantly reasserting white men as the authority. And I don't find it unbelievable that in the 21st century, uh, I, I find it unbelievable that we have to teach like this. And in the new curriculum, well, even Lord of the Flies is an imperialistic um, text. And I, I think what she's um, saying there is the frustration that many, many teachers feel with representation, the idea that children should be able to see themselves in the things that we are learning at school, that children should have something that they can relate to that speaks to their experiences um, of, their own, um, of their own lives. Um, and what the Tories are saying, aren't they, is that children should learn this particular kind of knowledge, the knowledge that comes from, you know, it's created up here, it's created in Oxford and Cambridge um, and those kind of places, and then it's transmitted, and this is where I want to, you know, come on in a bit to talk about the way in which we teach and a bit of, and about pedagogy, it's transmitted um, by teachers standing at the front through what we call in, in education direct instruction, the kind of jug and mug uh, method. Teacher stands, they pour uh, knowledge into children's heads, um, and they learn. And Gove, um, I talked about a lot because he was the kind of architect of this new project, um, but now he has a doppelganger, um, the school's minister, Nick, G Nick Gibb. They talk a lot about what they call the core knowledge um, curriculum, and he puts the case for the knowledge curriculum in, in social justice um, terms, actually. Knowledge, uh, they argue, gives you power. If you have this kind of knowledge, if you know about Cicero and if you know about the Iliad, you're going to be very powerful. Um, it gives you access, this is you know, his quote, it gives you access to the club, the, the, the elite club. Like this is a club that we all want to belong to. Um, it gives you access um, to the club. It, it's not true that it will ever give you access to the club, and that's something that people might want to um, talk about, um, you know, this idea of social mobility just being a complete um, farce. But that's the social justice case um, that they put. And this all comes from the American um, former left-wing educationalist, but now really firmly on the right, I believe, um, E.D. Hirsch, um, who talks about there being um, a core... Uh, who talks about core knowledge and a core uh, knowledge curriculum. And although you know, we haven't got time in a meeting to really explore all of the different things that Hirsch says that's wrong, it's just worth noting um, as a, a one of the tenets of his work. So he talks about something called intellectual capital. So he says that middle-class children and, and you know, the children of the rich, they go to school with a whole bank of what he calls intellectual capital that they've got from their parents. So you know, the museums or whatever it is that they've been to that, about their language being much more advanced um, and that working class children, uh, black children in particular um, in, in, Hirsch's, uh, in Hirsch's work, um, come to school with a, with a deficit that has to be mended and fixed in order for those children um, to, to achieve. He says that, um, that the rich children come to school with experience and knowledge that gives them, and this is his quote, the, ve the Velcro to gain still more knowledge. Um, so schools have to give working class children the knowledge that others have. And in terms of curriculum delivery, this takes place in a very particular way as well. So it's not just about what um, they need to know, it's also about how they need to, uh, to learn it. So um, uh, in terms of the curriculum delivery, this takes place... Um, in a way that the, uh, the sort of towering giant of um, progressive pedagogy, Paulo Freire, the Brazilian Paulo Freire, talks about as being the banking model, uh, where knowledge is parceled up into separate little sort of context-free pieces and then poured like a jug of water into the empty heads um, of, of pupils. And I think, now there's a problem, isn't there, um, with that model, because... It can sound uh, very appealing to people, and in today's educational world, there's quite a lot of people looking at Hirsch um, in the academies uh, in particular. I know um, in Lambeth Academy, for example, I know that they have introduced what they're calling the Hirschian curriculum, 
um, and they're saying, uh, you know, that the management team there are really selling it as, you know, the solution to empowering working class children, uh, to giving them the best start in life and referring to the ideas of Hirsch all the time. And it can really sound uh, really appealing to people. Um, but I want to talk about why it's wrong. And the first really is that it, it, it is this idea of deficit, the idea that working class children come to school with a cultural and, and intellectual um, deficit, I think is a fundamentally um, wrong premise. I don't think education is about fixing the deficiencies that exist in working class culture. Um, and I think actually that's a disdainful view um, of working class experience. So of course Austin and Mozart and Rembrandt are all worthy of study um, but actually so too are working class struggles that have taken past, you know, in the past um, whether it's how people won the vote, the Chartists um, and all of these sorts of things, the fight against racism, the anti-war movement, all of these, the history of pride, all of these things that have a relevance to children's lives today and this is something which Diane Ray um, and if people haven't read this and, and you're in education, it's an absolutely brilliant book. But buy it from Bookmarks. It's, it's really easy to read and it is packed full of really brilliant um, research, really sociological, lots and lots of interviews with kids about how they feel about school and stuff. Um, and it, it, she exposes that model, uh, what that model does to children, um, really, really brilliantly. So in, in her book, in terms of how the curriculum is delivered, she gives some really shocking examples of where that kind of deficit view of education can lead. So she talks about the head teacher of a big academy in, Lo in North London where the parents started to complain about what they call draconian behaviour systems. I don't know if people have seen some of the stuff that's going on now where there was an academy, um, a, a London academy that was exposed recently for you know, children not bringing in a pen and then sitting in isolation all day uh, not just in isolation, but in an isolation booth. That, you know, booths like this so that you can't see anybody. And they do their learning there all day because they haven't brought in a pen. That's the kind of um, punitive, not just punitive, I mean, it's, it's just cruelty, isn't it? It's, it's the, an, an absolute abuse um, of power that is going on in our school. So anyway, she um, interviews this head teacher. And this head teacher says this. What underpins this philosophy is that if they come from unstructured backgrounds where anything goes and rules and boundaries are not clear in the home, we need to ensure that they are clear here. So we run very tight systems here. You could call it a traditional approach or a formal approach. And I give that quote because I think, you know, they wouldn't put it like, Gib probably wouldn't put it like that. But our head teachers, not all of them, but, you know, there are many head teachers, that's their interpretation. The kids basically come from rubbish. They come from unstructured, anything goes backgrounds and school has to fix them. And I think that is a, a, an absolutely, like I said before, a really disdainful, um, a really, really disdainful view. And um, it says something else as well, doesn't it? It says that when they come to school, not only is school going to fix them, but they have to behave in certain ways. You have to accept the authority. You have to not question. You have to sit still. You have to listen to teachers. And actually, the vast, vast majority of people simply cannot learn, um, certainly not you know, learning deep concepts that require um, lots of dialogue and thought. They cannot learn those um, in this way. So I think when they talk about the traditional knowledge curriculum, what they're really talking about is the imposition of certain kinds of knowledge and an imposition by deeply authoritarian means. And you see, what they want really is for kids to learn and, sorry, what they want kids to learn and how they want them to learn it are flip sides of the same coin. The curriculum and the pedagogy required to deliver it are um, are. are you know, deeply, deeply um, intertwined, totally inseparable. Because, you know, if you have got a dry, fact-based curriculum, it really can only be delivered by the most repressive teaching methods, um, I would argue. You know, direct instruction, teacher at the front, child with textbook, um, and, and all of the rest of it. So do you remember what I said 
before about uh, they're also not just being the formal curriculum but a hidden curriculum um, as well in our school so the head teacher in North London quote shows exactly what working class children are learning at school as well doesn't it not just in terms of the formal curriculum they're learning you come from a background that is rubbish you come from a background that is worthless you have to come to school you have to sit and listen to teachers who are the font of all knowledge impart their wisdom to you don't challenge and one day you might be able to be better than the rubbish that you came from um, and that's stark and crude but I don't I don't think it's uh, you know I think when you look at the state of education in many schools today I think it looks like that and I think that's a damning indictment on the education um, system and it's something that we have to fight very hard as socialists and have quite a serious discussion about how we take this on and how we start um, to roll it back and is it no it's no surprise then is it that when you have a curriculum and teaching methods that alienate children from learning that alienate children from you know if you want to um, you know be extra theoretical about it their species being what makes us human our ability to think to transform the world you take you take that away from people is it any wonder that behavior and all of these sorts of things um, feel uh, feel like you know to many people uh, I, I wouldn't say it is out of control but you know you hear all the time don't you that people saying our oh, behavior has gone mad um, and all of the rest of it um, they are children are becoming increasingly alienated from formal education and again the Diane Ray book is brilliant about that and she talks about kids that talk about being rubbish at school but in their own spare time they're doing carpentry and building massive, uh, you know, massive um, bits of furniture and they're measuring and they're doing all the maths and that's their, like their hobby. But they don't link that to learning at, um, at, at school um, in that way. So, they, you know, they've got skills, they've got capability. They're not rubbish, actually. What they are is incredibly, um, incredibly alienated at work. So Gibb and his like might talk about social justice in their model, but actually their model is, more, is all about old-fashioned social control. And I talked a little bit about, well, I didn't, I mentioned Freire, um, when I talked about the banking model, this empty jug um, model of education. Um, and I want to say, I want to come on just to talk a little bit about him. Now, there's loads of people that have got brilliant things to say about education. And they're not all Marxist, John Dewey, Brilliant. Barnes is a lot to say. Um, Vygotsky, interestingly, Vygotsky has just come up through all through Marxism yesterday, and I think we need to start to think through collectively what, what Vygotsky means, not just in terms of education, but you know, in, in the mental, mental health, all kinds of um, things. John Parrington's meeting yesterday. Um, but, so go away and read it, but I'm not going to talk about Vygotsky. I'm going to talk about Paolo Freire. Um, and what he had to say in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is an, a brilliant book. It's not an easy read, but actually there's a really good student reader um, that's just come out, a, a student guide. It's called Student's Guide to Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it's great. The first half of it goes through the influence of, on Freire, and the second half is like goes through chapter by chapter um, what he had to say in the book, and then gives quotes and then sort of explanations and stuff. And I, I would really recommend that. I don't know if it's available in bookmarks, but perhaps, no, no, it's not. And can't get it from bookmarks, but they'll probably get it in. Don't you, 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 Dave? You can get it from bookmarks because you can get any book from bookmarks. <laughs> can't you? I know. I get my school books from bookmarks. Don't use Amazon. Um, so he had this to say, and, and his, his sole purpose is about education as a liberatory experience. It should be something that is about the emancipation of the human spirit. And he says this, he says, no pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own examples in their struggle for redemption. When you talk about the curriculum, the core knowledge curriculum, the models that they hold up as being, you know, access to the club, he's saying, no, we don't want to simply emulate 
you. That's not what this is. A, that's not what education should be about. The emulation of ruling class role models. What we want is something that represents us, that represents our class in their struggle for a better society. And what Friere uh, sets out to do is to make education a really liberatory experience, not by holding up some kind of false promise that if you sit still and listen and behave and absorb knowledge, you can gain access um, to that club. No. Instead, Freire talks about the need to develop a pedagogy that is forged with and as part of the working class, not as something that is done to them from on high, but as something that is, um, that is constructed collaboratively and together. Children, in other words, should be the subjects and not the objects of education. I think that's a really key thing that as Marxists we should take from uh, Freire's work. And in Pedagogy the Oppressed, he has something else that I want to just quote because I think it leads into uh, the sort of final part of my meeting, which is about the processes by which we learn um, best. And he says something that I think really sums it up. He says, For apart from inquiry, apart from the praxis, individuals cannot truly be human. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through restless, impatient, continuing, continuing, Hopeful inquiry. Human beings pursue the world with the world and with each other. And he talks about um, the need for learning, or well, how not just the need for it, but that it is intrinsically linked to inquiry, to questioning, to problem solving. Um, it's intrinsically linked to dialogue, to talk. Um, striving for answers, and crucially, that learning is a social experience. It is something that we do together, and it's something that we need to co do collaboratively in order to really construct real meaning and new meaning all the time. And I think we have to say that Ferreri was right when he posed this kind of questioning and inquiry-led learning against the authoritarian methods of the banking model. Um, so in the banking model, children and teachers are at opposite ends of the pole, aren't they? The teacher holds the knowledge, the child is ignorant. The teacher needs to, uh, sorry, the child needs to passively conform, soak up as much of the teacher's knowledge as possible. But of course we know something, uh, well at least I, I hope we know something, which is that um, this is alienating for teachers and it is alienating for children and because of that it does not make for good learning and you know one of the, just as an aside one of the crazy things about capitalism is that the banking model doesn't actually even work in terms of capitalist exploitation so the, uh, the, the CBI Confederation of British Industry is um, having a huge argument with the Department for Education because the banking model, the core knowledge model, isn't producing the kind of problem-solving, investigative um, uh, minds that we need to make British that we need that they need to make British capitalism compete on on a world stage. Now, obviously, we're not on the CBI side, but it's interesting that that, that is a, a tension within capitalism. So I wanted to sort of put that. Um, put that in really. We're not motivated by the needs of capitalism though, are we? We're motivated by ideas that can help make education a liberating experience for people. And here I think it's really important to remember that learning is, you know, we've said it before, but learning is deeply, deeply social. We learn through thinking and discussing and relating new problems and knowledge to knowledge and experiences that we already, that we already have. So at the moment, believe it or not, there is an actual attack on group work um, in schools. Um, you know, it's wishy-washy, pinko, liberal, whatever, you know, sitting around kids having a nice time, all just chatting to each other about war or, you know, what, whatever they want, whatever the sort of lefty teacher's trying to uh, get them all to be kind and work with each other. And, you know, like these things aren't even important. And I don't know if... Um, I, I do a lot of... Um, I shouldn't because it's a waste of time, really, but I, I do a lot of tweets. I do a lot on Twitter. Um, and uh, their Twitter, the Twitter sphere is full of the Hersheans and the Gibbites. Um, and they, they just hate group work. They hate it. They, I don't, and it, it's a huge, it, it's every day you'll see there, um, you know, they'll post up some research that shows that group work's a load of, um, a load of shit. Um, 
uh, and and um, and all of the rest of it. You know, someone said, "Oh, you know, it's the spell it how you like, man culture." <laughs> you know, that's what we're that's what we're um, that's what we're teaching them. Um, so they're wrong. <laughs> Sorry, they are wrong um, because actually dialogue is really crucial to learning. Talking language is really really important to learning. If you think about writing for example, and sentence construction, you need to be able to compose a sentence in your head uh, and to understand that it's different from speech. So, you, you know, you have a speech thing and then you compose it into a written sentence in your head and you write it down. But it, it starts with speech. It starts with language. That's why the best writing that you get at school is writing that has been based on doing a lot of talking with children, chucking out ideas, make, you know, trying to get people to reach for the vocabulary. Um, you know, and that's, that's discussion. That's all, um, all dialogic um, all dialogic teachings, and uh, you know, take English. I'm, I'm talk, talk about English quite a bit, but uh, I'm going to come. I'll talk about maths before we finish. I've got five minutes. I think I've got enough time. Um, and, you know, literature is a really funny thing, isn't it? Because there's not one way to interpret lit a, a piece of literature. We can read the same piece of literature and have completely different. Uh, views on how it affects us, whether we like it or not, whether we don't like, whether it speaks to us or not, um, whether you know, um, based on our own experiences. Often, sometimes you know, people who have vastly different experiences from the experience that you, I would have um, have a different reading of the same text. So, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, I think a, a brilliant poem, Wil the Wilfred o Owen poem, Dolce Decorum Esque, about the First World War, um, for example. Um, people would take different. It's a you know classic text. It's taught in uh, taught in schools a lot, um, and should be I think because it's you know it's a really important piece of poetry um, to know about. And um, I I just read it not because I'm great at reading poetry, but I, just to give you an idea of the different interpretations that you could have from it. So bent like double. Sorry, bent double like old beggars under sacks, not need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Now, I don't think it's possible to have a reading of that text when you live in the modern world without thinking about modern warfare. Um, and if you can imagine, I mean, I teach a lot of children from refugee backgrounds that have fled war, um, have fled gas shells dropping behind. Now, this poem would speak to their experience in a way that it wouldn't speak uh, to mine. But the sharing of their experience with others teaches everybody, doesn't it? So. We learn from each other. We don't just learn from the teacher. We learn from the experiences of, um, of other people. I know just from my, my own son, he's gone to nursery, he's come back, he's got amazing language development. It's just sudden, and it's not because a teacher has told him new vocabulary. It's because he's around all these other kids all the time and they're using words and he's teaching them words. That's just a fundamental uh, way in which children... Uh, children's language um, develops. They teach each other through talk and play and, and, and co-construction. Um, but of course, that kind of dialogic pedagogy where children can feel powerful and knowledgeable in their own right is something that poses a real danger, isn't it, to the likes of Gove and Gibb and those people that want our schools to be places where children really just learn their place. Um, and that's why education is such a key battleground for us. Um, and while at the same time as, you know, the fights that go on around pay and, and pensions and workloads and all of those things that, you know, the teachers in the room have to take incredibly seriously as, as you know, um, as trade unionists and everything, we also have to raise an argument and link those questions to the questions of education, what is taught and the way it is taught um, in our schools. Um, and we have to be the best fighters, I think, for pedagogical practices that enable children to feel 
more than uh, the said the education system um, the, you know the likes of Gib or whatever want them to feel we want it to be a liberating experience uh, you know in in Russia in 1917 we caught a glimpse and you know people say it all the time in every meeting don't they we caught a glimpse of what it could look like before it, the revolution was rolled back and I always end an education meeting like this because Luna Charsky who was the, commi the commis commissar for education um, in the uh, Bolsheviks Education Act uh, the first Education Act preamble says this and I want to end with this quote because I think it talks to the kind of education that we would like to see and why we need to have a revolution and fight for a better world in order to see it. So he says, the personality shall remain as the highest value in the socialist culture. This personality, however, can develop its inclinations in all possible luxury only in a harmonious society of equals. We, i.e. the government, do not forget the right of an individual to his own peculiar development. It is not necessary for us to cut short a personality, to cheat it, to cast it into moulds, because the stability of the socialist community is based not on the uniformity of the barracks, not on artificial drill, not on religious and aesthetic deceptions, but on an actual solidarity of interests and comrades. That's the kind of society I think we're fighting for today. <laughs> This might be a bit rambling. Um, I'm not a teacher. I'm an artist. <laughs> it always sounds a bit poncy when you say that, but it's what I do. Um, and I wanted to talk a bit about measuring uh, because it's something that I found in the arts a lot, that you have to prove what you do, you have to prove the impact of what you do, and I think it, it's like a 100 times more fold in education. And I think, you know, all of the tests that children go through in primary and then secondary school, and all of the way that their lessons are structured and everything that they have to do is all structured around being able to prove what you have learned, what your teacher has taught you. It puts a huge amount of pressure on teachers, but it also puts a huge amount of pressure on children and it's very isolating and it fails children all the way through education. And actually it's got nothing to do with learning and it's all about um, this whole privatization and the whole kind of neoliberal um, way of looking at the world that you can measure things, you can quantize them and then you can sell them. Um, and I think that's what's happening in education. Um, I was very, very lucky to meet um, the woman who's the head of my, my daughter's nursery who was interested in exploring other ways of um, learning. She was, uh, she was talking about um, uh, things that aren't product-based, um, doing projects that are, don't have an outcome, which was fascinating to me, and particularly about um, things that you didn't have to do individually, so you don't sit down with a piece of paper and you make your own thing. So we did a whole week of um, playing with clay, which is what I do, I'm a sculptor. So I was interested in just exploring um, how clay changes. You know, from being very soft to being very hard, all the bits in between, doing things that are liquid. Uh, we used the whole floor space, covered it in hessian, and they just played for a week and did stuff. And it was spectacular what they did. Um, and they had absolutely no problem with, you know, making something that wasn't a face or making something, you know, they just did stuff. And I think it was actually quite scientific what they did. You know, you test something until it breaks, and then you do something with that. And I th it's quite dialectic, actually, I think, what they were doing. We invited the parents in as well, so that they, it was much, much harder working with parents. <laughs> <laughs> but by the end of the week, you know, they were doing stuff with their kids. If you kind of set it up so that you say, okay, we'll do this first, cover something in clay first, and then do something with that, then they get into the whole, you know, just using it. Um, I have to say that the, the, it's kind of, my eight-year-old son hates school. He hates all, everything about it because it has nothing to do with what's going on in his head. Um, and I'm very keen to kind of push this in. But I think there is a growing movement in schools, actually, uh, to move away, for, to, to, to go less with product-based stuff and more with process. Um, certainly in the, in the, in the reception at my, my son's school, the teachers there are saying, this is just, we can't do it any other way. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Um, okay, I really wanted to talk about something other than pedagogy, really, because I think there are two parallel lines of experience for children in schools. One is what they're taught and how they're taught, which Jess has, I think, been fantastic on. But there's also the pastoral experience. And I, for my sins, for 
virtually 36 years, have been a pastoral head in, a school, in various schools. And it, I think it's really interesting about how that has really changed as well. Because that used to be the space that we had as teachers in schools to really learn who children were, to really learn who they were as individuals. I mean, just a, a classic example in primary, though I'm a secondary head, the fact that really nobody anymore in primary school seems to do shell and, show and tell. You know, you, know, uh, you know, there aren't tadpoles in the uh, schools, I, you know, all sorts of things. But, I mean, I used to run, you know, in secondary school, we used to normally talk about what kids had watched on the telly often in pastoral time because you found from their experiences of soap operas all sorts of things about what they thought about the world, moral issues, their own experiences, family, etc. That has changed enormously. And that used to be something that allowed us, particularly as revolutionaries in the classroom, to be the champions of the oppressed. And let me tell you, there are a lot more oppressed people in schools now than ever before. The hierarchy is formulated from the head at the top, teachers, TAs, kids. And then I have to say, I think parents, by and large, are left at the bottom. And the distinction now that schools make between parents who are useless and middle-class parents, lots of kids are very aware of what's going on about that in their own schools. The difference between the way that middle-class children are, are perhaps disciplined uh, for want of a better word, or, um, and working-class children. And pastoral has now become about rules, checking you've got your five for the day, checking you have got your ruler, checking you've got the right trainers on, making sure your the tick on your um, rucksack isn't white, it's black, it isn't la large, it's small, all these kind of things that de destroy any ability to build a relationship um, with children. And I'm going to say, I mean, as a pastoral head, <clears throat> I used to insist that one of my targets each year was to have no detentions. Uh, apart from the fact it relieves you, I mean, of hours of hours of work. Uh, apart, but actually, it's not that I didn't have ways of trying to deal with children. I used to call them, I used to say to kids, we're going to have a discussion after school, if that's okay, about our relationship, about what's going on. You know, let's... And I insisted that the conversation had to be started by the child. If a child is misbehaving in your class, for want of a better word, what they have to provide the ex explanation. A completely, and I mean, I, 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 I'll be honest, I was a pastoral head for 36 years, and I don't actually remember ever excluding a child. I probably, my Facebook might remind me if I ask some of the kids, it might remind me that I did at some point, I can't remember it. But I actually always went in and argued with the head or argued with the governors about why a child shouldn't be excluded. Because I don't think a kid who's involved in gang crime, leaving him out in his housing estate for three weeks or a week on his own without... Anyway, so I think, that, I think that's a very important part. I think we have to be the champions of the parents. We have to be the champions of the children. They're oppressed in this rotten system. And their learning conditions are our working conditions. And the stricter the school is, they come back to you. You know, they, the dress code comes to you as a teacher after they've imposed the uniform and behaviour policies. Thanks very much, comrades. Um, I, w I will just ask comrades to, to try and keep to three minutes, but, but also um, I have quite a lot of hands go up at, at once at the beginning. So if you do indicate, I will make a note here, um, and I'll do my very, very best to call you in. But um, the comrade in the second row in the, the striped top, and then the comrade in the second row with the glasses, if that's all right. Um. When I was at school, I actually used to really enjoy chemistry, um, partly because you could do fun things like chucking bits of phosphorus into water and seeing what happened when you put magnesium in a Bunsen burner. And it was all quite exciting and, and you know, practical and experimental and whatever. And I think, actually, I watch quite a lot of science lessons um, these days because I basically my job in school is looking after new teachers, so I have to do quite a lot of observations in a very supportive way. Um, and, um, um, you know, in a, you know, a useful, like, how, let's talk about what, you know, what you were doing kind of way. And I think what's really struck me about, about the way that science, for example, is taught 
is that teachers are trying quite hard to actually make it interesting and relevant. But actually, the amount of practical they're allowed is minimal, okay? The amount of experimentation they're allowed is minimal. And there is this whole focus on knowledge. And I think it's the way that knowledge is being constructed that is really problematic. So, for example, for GCSE science these days, you don't, you're not allowed to have a copy of the periodic table. You're not allowed to take a copy of the relevant equations to do with electricity or whatever into the exam. You have to memorise them. Now, I'm not a scientist, I'm an English teacher, but my would, I would have thought that in real life, if you're doing a few practical things that involve science, you might bother to check the equations in a, online or on a book before you actually put them in practice and you saw a bridge fall down or something like that. You know, it's just, it doesn't make sense in terms of knowledge and actually our access to knowledge and how we use it. And I think one of the issues around, around the whole obsession with knowledge is that actually, first of all, it is obviously a very privileged form of knowledge, what counts and what doesn't, but also the way in which it is delivered as unproblematic, the way in which, it is, um, in which, we're, um, in which stu students are asked to accept it and to see what's important. So, for example, um, you know, if you look at the history curriculum, you will, a lot of schools teach history of the Russian Revolution. People will not be surprised to understand, to, to hear that the narrative is almost invariably Leninism leads to Stalinism, and trying to challenge that is actually quite difficult. Um, not very many schools teach the English Revolution, and actually one of my best memories from school is having a fantastic teacher in the third year, I think it was, who was an absolute expert on the level as the diggers in the English Revolution. And actually, it's something that's stayed with me ever since because of that level of inspiration and the fact that there was conflict involved. And I think what you're actually getting with, with the whole obsession with knowledge is a very um, kind of reified form of knowledge and one that actually you get go going on about, you know, students need to have this core body of knowledge and they need to be able to connect things up. And I don't have a problem with knowledge. I don't have, a, obviously, I don't have a problem with historical fact either. Like, it's useful to know that the Elizabethans were not the Victorians, for example, um, and so on and so forth. But actually, what they're actually doing by putting it into very, very traditionally defined boxes is actually creating a very disconnected set of knowledges so that students don't actually apply one piece of knowledge to another and one skill to another. And I think that in itself is very alienating because it, again, goes back to that very, very top-down you know, you will learn this and this and this and they don't connect. You just need to know it because we say it's important kind of model. And I think that's the whole thing that's happening with, with the curriculum. And one very final thing, actually, um, which I think is very directly the effect of the new GCSEs, which I hope some students will talk about because I think everybody agrees they're a nightmare, is that actually what's really happening in secondary schools is because the new GCSEs are so hard and so alienating, they're pushing that right back down into, you know, your first year into school. So, for example, my department, and my school is probably about as liberal as you get these days, and, um, but in quite a lot of ways. But actually, we used to do a great introductory unit to poetry. We used to look at um, rap poetry. We used to look at spoken poetry. Somebody comes in, you know, a couple of years ago and says, well, the new GCSE says they've got to do lots of 19th century stuff, so they're going to spend a whole half term doing the Ancient Mariner, which, let me tell you, is the most miserable poem in existence. So, you know, it's, I think it's the whole way knowledge is being constructed. It's very alienating. Thank you very much. The comrade with the glasses from the second row. Yeah, I want to reinforce the central message that uh, Jess put across about why arguments around pedagogy in the curriculum are absolutely central. Because it, it's go back to what Marx argued in the Communist Manifesto about class struggle. It's sometimes open, sometimes hidden, but they also went on to say it takes place on different levels. It can take place on an economic level, a political level, and an ideological level. And that's true in education. Of course, as teachers, we have to fight on economic questions. Uh, so at the moment, quite rightly, we're agitating, and Jess will be arguing on the national executive why we need to have a strike over funding cuts or over pay things. That's, that's absolutely right and a central part of what we do. It's also political. We have to challenge you know, government policy on education, academies. There's a whole set of political things we have to do. But also it takes place ideologically, and in the way that Je Jess argued, the question of... The, the what we learn, the curriculum, and the how is a central battle in education. It's one which any socialist is just as important as the other two. 
And if we neglect that, we're not fighting on all fronts of the class struggle. And that's why in the National Union, we've been pushing very hard for uh, the National Education Union to organize a major conference on curriculum and the pedagogy, which I think is going to take place later this year or early next, and will be something we all really need to build. And because it, it's right what Jess argued, that if you have a certain m model of this is what we want kids, you know, a cer certain fixed body of knowledge, that goes hand in hand with an authoritarian transmission model of pedagogy. It is two sides of the same coin. And we have to challenge it different, that we have different visions of w what it is children learn. And necessarily, that involves a very different approach to how that, that's taught. And just as you know, the people have quite rightly talked about you know, literature and English, I'm a maths teacher. And I want to argue that the same ideas are apply in every area of the curriculum. So I'll just to give you a, a couple of bits of a flavor of it. Um, I'm for knowledge. Pythagoras theorem, very important, people need to know it. And anybody who doesn't know it, it's embarrassing. You should know it. It's a very important piece of, uh, of human knowledge. And I'll argue that all day and all night. But what you could do is I've got stand here, and I'm sure you all remember this from school. There's a right angle triangle, blah, blah, blah. The square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares. On the other two squares, C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Right, write that down, learn it, and now here's 20 questions. Make sure you practice how to do it. That's dreadful, in my opinion. But that's the model that Gibb and Govan people would have you do. What I would much prefer, because actually it's a, it doesn't really get you to understand anything, I would much prefer to say to kids, right, draw lots of triangles. Now draw any shape you like on the square. Actually, Pythagoras theme isn't about squares. Uh, draw squares, draw triangles, draw semicircles, draw random shapes, you know, as long as they're all the same type of shape on each. Now work out the areas. What do you notice? And what you notice, actually, it's about ratio and scaling. It doesn't matter what shape you draw. The relationship between the areas. So Pythagoras theorem actually works, even if you don't draw squares. If you draw semicircles, the relationship between their areas is the same. And get the kids to discover that for themselves. And it's about scaling and ratios and similarity. It's a much deeper and much richer way of understanding Pythagoras. And they've constructed a whole set of knowledge alongside you as a teacher while they're doing it. And that's a, di a different type of people. It's core construction of meaning. If you like, there's a big debate. In broad educational terms, given people stand for what I call a behaviorist model. It's about we have the knowledge and we're going to transmit that. And you have to learn it you know, off by, by road. I'm much for, we have to argue for a much more constructivist approach that, yes, there is knowledge and skills, but it's about the core construction of meaning and understanding with the teacher as a guide and a facilitator. And it's not just about small kids. I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this. People say all that. That's all right for little kids. Look, I teach A-level further maths, nearly in university, something as abstract as group theory. You know how I teach it? I sit down and play noughts and crosses with these 18-year-old kids who are all going to get A's and their stars, and I smash them to pieces playing that game and then I'll play some other games and I smash them to pieces on that game and then I say how do I do that and then we look at the mathematics that I'm using which means I win the game and the kids are really interested and motivated about it but we construct the knowledge together and that's our vision of teaching and learning and it's different to Gibbon Gobes and it's just as important as striking on peer conditions and challenging around academies. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose I wanted to come back a little bit, actually, on some of those ideas, because um, Jess was right to talk about the alienation of the students from their own sort of process of learning, but also it's about alienating teachers from the process of how we educate. Um, there's an awful lot of, these are the systems that you have to follow. I'm actually about to return from maternity leave to a new system of behaviour management at our school, where if a child does anything from throwing a chair across a room to forgetting to bring a pen with them, they get across and that's the detention for the next day. And if they miss a detention or they have two detentions in a week, they have an after school detention on a Friday. Um, so you're then told as a teacher that it's your responsibility to make sure that you are upholding those standards because if you're not, then you're letting down your colleagues because you're making behavior difficult for your colleagues. I, I, I'm not suggesting that this is a particular problem just in my school. This is generalized. This is across education. There are then sort of strict expectations about how you go about teaching and how you go about feeding back to students and how you go about recording that you fed back to students. And so I've heard a story about a colleague who um, was given an exercise book of one of their students and a red pen, because we mark in green, and the students respond to our marking in red pen. And they were given a red pen and told, this book's going to the governors, 
Can we make sure that there's enough red pen here? Can we make sure that this book has enough evidence that students have read your feedback and responded to it? Now, I'm not suggesting that the colleague was being told to make up some red pen writing of their own. <laughs> That's for others to infer if they so choose. Um, but, th but this is alienating to teachers. And the reason they are alienating us and encouraging us to focus on the trivial is because actually, what can we do if we're not alienated, if we're not focusing our attention on giving people X's and making sure that they have their shirt tucked in as they enter the room and that they've written enough in red pen of the right sort of appearing feedback. Actually, we can use the curriculum as a means of challenge. And one example from English is, um, I think that there are some socialists on the AQA exam board because we have a lot of Shelley. And we also have things like um, John Agard's Checking Out My History. I had a whole lesson with my year nines just before I broke up on what is it that you think we should be teaching you that you're not learning? And I had about three students in the classroom who were like, Miss, we're Irish. We don't learn enough about what the British did to Ireland. And they spent about 10 minutes having a bit of a rant about it. Actually, that's our power. That's how we subvert. That's how we get the children thinking. And that's the important thing that we need to be pushing for as much as possible. Thank you very much, comrades. If I can just ask comrades to, to just be diligent with time. I've had a lot of people indicate to speak. Yeah, well, say what you like about that. But I'll, I'll just call the comrades with the glasses at the front um, and then the comrades with the red hat. Yeah, I wanted to um, talk a bit about uh, this issue of you know facts versus concepts and deeper understanding. Because I, I teach at Oxford University. I teach genetics and uh, biochemistry to the medics there. And it's interesting, actually, how much we're seeing this sort of is it in the curriculum sort of thing creeping into into medicine actually I get I, I did a talk about bioinformatics uh, to the third year students and uh, bioinformatics is this way of using computers to really understand more about how the genome relates to disease and that kind of thing and I did get a student who said how is this going to help me pass the exam so I had a bit of a rant at them explained why it's a critical part of uh, medicine but I, I, I think the uh, you can see this in the universities the fact that there is there's limits to how much we can kind of uh, go outside this kind of narrow kind of framework. It's not just about the fact, you know, that there is this quite a rigid curriculum. You'd think in a place like Oxford with its tutorial system, you know, two, two or three students uh, to a tutor, you'd have lots of opportunities. But I'm limited to how much I can talk about the kind of politics and history of genetics. I try and get it in there, but it's surprising how, how little it can help the, the students in, in, in their exam. And, and it's, it's really, I, I think, uh, not uh, obviously a, re a revelation in our universities there's been a kind of narrowness and, and a kind of um, teaching is, is, is kind of geared towards the, 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 the needs and the, uh, the, the ruling class. This has been going on for a while. I was reading an, a book about ancient Rome and talking to, uh, and how they used divide and rule. And I was talking to a friend who was a, a professor of post-colonial post -colonial literature at Oxford and commenting on how it's similar it was to what had happened in Iraq and places like that. And she said, oh, it's not a coincidence at all. That was th those classicists schooled Oxford University were the ones who went out there and carved out those, those boundaries. But what I think we're finding more and more with the crisis in capitalism is how much mystification there is about what's really going on in the world. So, for instance, I go to college for lunch every day and I talk to other tutors. I mean, I, I talk to economists and, and all sorts of interesting people. I was talking to an economist there and, and saying how in medicine we would have typically question, questions about, you know, how is the genome project going to help medicine and research in the future? And I says, you must have similar things like how, you know, about the crisis, what caused the crisis uh, in capitalism? And he says, oh, no, nothing like that. I, I, I'm a microeconomist. I, I don't deal in those kind of bigger issues. Uh, and that's a sort of assignment. So just to end, really, I think, how do we get around this problem? Well, I think one of the interesting things that came out of the UQ strike was how much it, in, in, in some institutions there were teachings where we could explore these political, much bigger questions uh, in a really exciting way. And I think also it's interesting that there are people out there who do want to challenge this kind of narrowness, this kind of teaching to facts and the rest of it. I've been in conversations recently with the publisher, but people who publish uh, Philip Pullman's novels, who, who want to have a whole whole series of science books that kind of challenge this whole idea about science is just about facts and they want to look at ch have questioning science and who does science and all the kind of politics and things of it and they're linked to the scholastic in the United States and they're really quite keen to sort of have this new angle on science so I, I think also I've learned that you know there are schools out there who are really keen to sort of explore these these are the 
uh, ways of, of teaching. I think what we've got to do is to think, how can we pull all these things together? And just to end real, I'm not going to say anything about Vygotsky and, and, and education, but it's interesting, there's some really interesting studies looking about is bringing community into the classroom, that kind of thing. But it's interesting that Vygotsky himself w was educated at a kind of an alternative university outside the mainstream system because all the, all the kind of teachers' revolutions have been kicked out of the main system. And he got that kind of uh, experience from that and I think we should be aiming to kind of pull together the people who were radicalised by the UQ strike, teachers and the rest of it to try and break down some of these boundaries. Thanks. Yeah, the question of Pythagoras and uh, a friend of mine, she's a teacher and she uh, did some artist uh, cubism in class and then, then did the geometry so they started painting and things and then analysed their own paintings. Uh, the question of punishment. I think the word punishment should be banished completely. Uh, I'll give one example. I mean, I'm not a teacher, but I did three months English teaching at a local school. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, we had this WhatsApp group amongst a few teachers. And we, I were on the Friday afternoon, got this WhatsApp message, message yeah, uh, school kid so-and-so is banned from playing football for the whole of next week. So <laughs> I gave four answers. I don't know if I've got them all in my head. One of them was, look, that means that we have, the other colleagues have to check on this particular kin for the whole week, keep it in mind, he's not allowed to play football. It's unrealistic anyway. I mean, who's going to do it? And second of all, uh, if he gets too many punishments, in the end, this kid is going to say, oh, I've got 120 punishments, and he's going to be proud of it in the end. I mean, if you, if you, you get used to it. Yeah? Uh, so it's just no way. Yeah? And um, I do have one question. Um, but the, the, the kids I had, to a certain extent, I think they, real, they sort of did come from relatively poor backgrounds, and they, they sort of realized they will probably never get a good job anyway, so how much, th however they learn, or what, uh, whatever methods you use, and they might enjoy it a little bit, but at the backs of their heads, they're saying, I really don't want this anyway. However, you, however nicely you teach me, however exciting things you do, there's a lot of set, set scepticism in their heads. And how do you get over that? Thank you very much, comrades. Um, the comrade with the glasses. Uh, thanks. Uh, just a um, couple of bits. Um, one is I wanted, because I followed Jess on social media a little bit, so... Um, do you have, would you say anything about Mantle of the Expert as a good example of progressive pedagogy? Um, and the other thing I just wanted to talk about was, um, <laughs> well, I'm designing a scheme of work and I want to use it, so I just want to nick some ideas. <laughs> um, and then, yes, just the other thing was just to think about the way in which um, support is really important around in schools. The idea that, um, that Jess talked about, that some there's this idea emerging that if you're from working class background, then your experience is totally unstructured, which obviously is not the normal working class experience. But n there are definitely students in our schools who have come from trauma, who have come from very difficult backgrounds. And of course, what they don't need is to be disciplined for that. What they need is support. What they need is pastoral staff who know them, who know their families and know the situations. But of course, that's expensive. And in a time of falling budgets, what we're finding is that it's pastoral support staff, the ones who do this really vital work supporting our students, that are the first to go. And so when we're fighting for fully funded education, one of the things we must be really, uh, really honest about is we need that money so that there is the support, so that our schools are supportive and encouraging environments. Thanks. Thank you very much, comrade. Comrade in the green top. Then the comrade in the blue top after. Hi. Um, so I did my GCSEs five years ago now. So I'm quite young, I guess. Um, so um, you were saying a bit about like learning facts, but it's actually more than just facts. It's words. Like you have to use specific words in an exam, or you get no marks. Like say, like for biology, like say say about cell reproduction. Say you like you know describe cell reproduction, all the splitting and all that stuff. If you don't say mitosis, you would get no marks. Like, like, I, like, I had to look at so many past papers and the mark schemes, and the mark schemes would just be lists of words. Like, it wasn't about describing what was happening. It wasn't even testing what you knew. It was testing, do you know this word? So you don't learn 
anything. Like I had to, <laughs> I had to memorize so many bloody scientific terms, like mitosis and meiosis and all that stuff. And and then um, and and to the comrade who was talking about um, memorizing like equations. Yes, but I remember for my maths GCSE and A level, you had to memorize so many mathematical formulas, and some of them were really long, like they're like like differentiation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, like you had to, and then for English, I remember my English UCSE, you couldn't bring the books in with you. So we had like two books that we had to read for an exam. You had to memorize the bloody books. Like you had to memorize quotes. And I remember, I used, although I used to sort of make up quotes, but, um, but yeah. And, um, so yeah, it's more, so it's not even just not, it's not even learning facts, it's learning words. D completely devoid from the facts and also about the English Revolution I actually did learn about that in school but all we learned was that they chopped off the king's head which was bad you know <laughs> and that they banned Christmas not nothing else just that they banned Christmas so okay that's all thank you very much uh, thanks my name is Mark Welch I'm from um the SWP in Dublin, and um, I'm also on the executive of my teachers' union, like yourself. Um, it's just always interesting to come to debates here in England and to hear, like, there's a very stark polarization between the traditional knowledge-based curriculum versus progressive education. I always find that we don't have that polarization in Ireland. It's, it's, it's strange to hear it so polarized, and I think it's unhelpful in some ways because, you know, we, talk, we, we it tends to lead people to say that knowledge is static, but think, for example, of the Higgs boson. I mean, that was discovered a couple of years ago. And that will be integrated into the so-called static body of knowledge that is science. So science isn't a static body of knowledge. I think we need to make a distinction between uh, what's on the curriculum and pedagogy. You can have a knowledge-based curriculum, which includes skills as well, and have different types of pedagogy. But I think what we're in danger of doing, and you might have heard the quote, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side, right? But there's another one now, and it's the peer at the rear, right? So sage on the stage, guide at the side, peer on the rear, at the rear. And what's starting to happen is teachers are becoming marginalized in, uh, in uh, increasingly. Teaching is being squeezed out. And my question would be, how can we, as teachers, lead and help students learn if we're, being, we're under a process of marginalization ourselves? We need to have the freedom, the professional autonomy, to teach in ways that we feel are best. Sometimes that will include, include group work, sometimes it won't. It will depend on what the actual task is. So I think we need to get away from, you know, sort of static or fixed um, concepts and fixed ideas of what we're talking about and try to have a, have a, a sort of more nuanced view uh, of what's going on. We can have knowledge, but we can also have, uh, you know, dialogic pedagogy. I mean, and just one final point, I mean, we're all disciplined. I mean, we're all here sta sitting quietly listening to me at the moment. But imagine everybody was shouting and roaring, and would you hear me? I mean, there's a cert discipline is not just something cruel, punishment, torture. There's a certain element of discipline as a means to an end so that we can all hear each other and things like that. I don't consider myself an authoritarian teacher. I teach Spanish and computer science. I don't consider myself an authoritarian for asking students to listen you know, to listen to me, and then we listen to other students that are speaking. I don't think that's authoritarian. So I think we just have to, you know, we have to have a bit less of a, a sort of a caricature almost of these two traditional uh, views of education. Thanks. Thank you very much, comrade. The comrade in the glasses. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of comrades have indicated to speak, and I, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to call anyone in. We have already overrun them. Unfortunately, we did start late, but uh, as I say, this will be the last speaker now feeling slightly an imposter actually in that case because I'm not a teacher but I've observed what's going on all my life but through kids and whatever and also through going out with Jane for the last, the last few years. I think people should, no, but people should start with, with, with this as a permanent crisis in the ruling class about what they want from ed education which means for, for us this is a very fertile battleground. You know, the crisis is on the one hand they want you, the kids to know their place and they state it explicitly in their in internal documents. I dug some out when I was a journalist on Socialist Worker back, back in the day, and, and they still do that. On the other hand, they want people who are capable of uh, 
you know, well-rounded individuals are going to be lifelong learning, going to be adaptable and, and all the rest of it. And these are um, a massively I in contradiction. So you're going to have that split at the top. This, you know, you talked about the CBI and, and, and whatever. You don't support the CBI. But nonetheless, it's fertile ground for us. The second thing is how liberating the, these discussions are. I mean, one of the big things that made me a socialist or stick with being a, being a socialist was when I was at school, a teacher gave me a rank-and-file pamphlet, which was essentially another education is, is possible. I was an extremely alienated kid and was a socialist teacher. And that, you know, that, that was transformative. I think it's transformative for, um, for, 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 for young teachers as well, to hear there's a battleground, there are alternatives. That doesn't, people don't go into, into teaching just as they don't go into my trade journalism to do what they're told. They go in either to to facilitate learning for kids or to speak truth to power and it's bashed out bashed out, out of you. So the debate is really, really important and I hope that that conference is a big success. And you can see this in the other, uh, you know, you can see it with the comrades doing in social work and whatever. The real echo of what happened after, after 68. The last thing I want, just want to say is that NEU is massively supportive of Stand Up to Racism, UAF and love, love Music Hate Racism and they've taken quite a big punt on supporting Love Music Hate Racism at the Notting Hill Carnival and it's really, really essential that anybody who's a teacher or anybody ar around that gets behind the, um, that initiative and I've got a bunch of flyers at the, at, at the door and please take it very, very seriously. We need to make that a success. Okay, thank you very much, comrade. So without further ado, I'll bring in Jess to sum up for five minutes. Wow. Uh, that, right, I'm going to be really, really quick, but I do want to come back on the comrade from Ireland because I don't agree with you. Um, I, um, I, th I think it is important to oppose the idea that there is a fixed body of knowledge and to oppose it quite vehemently, actually, because the problem with the view of the fixed body of knowledge is that it presents knowledge as neutral, and knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge is contested constructed and reconstructed by different people um, uh, all of the time. And when you decide what a fixed body of knowledge is, you are also deciding what it isn't. It's not just about what's included, it's about what is excluded. So when you look at Hirsch, there's a lot of, the, you know, a lot of stuff that you think, okay, that's good for children to know about, but it, what isn't in it is just as important. What isn't in it? Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, Crazy Horse. You know, it's about whose knowledge and the fact that it isn't, you know, that, that knowledge isn't something that is just fixed in time. It's, it, it's something that is contested and that can change. Um, and I think that's the problem with the core body of knowledge approach it doesn't accept that knowledge can change and knowledge can develop and that new knowledge is created and that it's a creative process it presents it as a neutral fixed thing to be poured in and that's why I think that it fits with the um, the, uh, the the didactic approach um, to teaching rather than a dialogic and I think we have to come down firmly on the side of the dialogic um, someone asked me to talk about Mantra the Expert but I'm, I haven't got enough time but I'm just going to say it's, yeah, I think it's fantastic, it's, dr it's drama based, it's a, a way of creating new uh, make believe worlds with children that they can have a sort of direction over it's brilliant, people should look it up um, the, the union um, has given masses of funding actually into training people in the method um, so you know, have a look at that um, Practice and experimentations come up a lot. And uh, this is, to me, the key. And, and Paul talked about maths and he talked about triangles. And I'm going to talk about triangles. We had a festival of triangles at my school because we didn't want to just teach children those like isosceles triangles, there's these regular triangles and this is how they look and let's draw them on the board and measure them with your protractor. We just gave kids triangles, loads and loads of different kinds of triangles what you're going to do with those. So, you know, you, I don't know people have seen Clixy. You can make amazing models out of Clixy. You can have um, triangles that you can use as artwork. You can create massive, ma amazing artwork, it turns out, when you use triangles. You can experiment with triangles, put them on a bit of paper, stick them down in different ways. Oh, they make other shapes. They can make squares. They can make hexagons. They can make all kinds of different things. Um, what you, and the teacher's role is therefore a facilitator. You've provided the triangles. Your role is then to stand back, actually, to watch really carefully what those children are doing. Okay, well, that one has made a hexagon. Um, and then you see other kids looking over. Oh, he's made 
do you know what shape that is? That's where the role of the teacher comes in, talking, well, do you know what shape that is? I wonder what if you put loads of those together. Well, it turns out you can make, well, you can't make a sphere, obviously, but you can make a, a, a you know, a, it looks like a ball, doesn't it? Um, it, it? What are the children learning from that kind of teaching? Because it is teaching, you know, we're, we're still directing and asking probing questions, assessing really carefully what they're doing through observation. We don't do enough observation in school. We do it a lot in the early years, our teacher reception, um, this year. We do a lot in the early years, but further up the school, observation's out. It's all tests, isn't it? You're not learning really what the kids know from a test. You're only really learning what they don't know. When you're watching children and you're providing rich experiences that are practically based, they will show you what they are able to do. And what they're able to do is much, much more than you would ever get from direct instruction. Um, and I, I'm, I, for me, that's... Um, uh, you know, the, the way that we have to do it. Um, and I just want to just give one little thing. This is how one child described their experience of testing in schools, because this is what we're doing to them. She says, I'm really scared about the SATs. Mrs. O'Brien came and talked to us about our spelling, and I'm no good at spelling. And David, the teacher, is giving us times table tests every morning, and I'm hopeless at times table, so I'm frightened. I'll do the SATs, and I'll be a nothing. And Diane says to her, I don't understand, honey. You can't be a nothing. She says, yes, you can because you have to get a, a level, like a level four or a level five. And if you're no good at spelling and times tables, you won't get those things. And so you're a nothing. Diane says, I'm sure that's not right. She says, yes, it is, because that's what Mrs. O'Brien was saying. That is what our system is doing to children. They are nothing. I'm nothing. I'm not even a level one. I'm a nothing. Um, and it's why, when you read that, it breaks your heart. And it's why it's so important that we have to fight and refight uh, to win a better education system um, I I in society. And I haven't got time. I've got loads of stuff down, but there's no time. So um, thank you. Okay. <laughs>